Welcome back to Challenges of Faith radio program. I'm Gary McCann. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. I'd like to acknowledge God and you, our listener. So far, we've looked at slavery here in the United States, while you've been looking at the slavery in your own country, the Black American, Native American, White American, Jewish American, Hispanic American, Asian American, interracial American. Did you forget about the others? All from a human secular perspective. You say, oh, wait a minute, Gary, before you go on, what other? Well, you'd have to go and listen to it, you know, as it relates to mulattoes. And then where did all skin tones come from as a human race? And then anti-Semitism from a biblical, biblical and spiritual perspective. And today we continue. You ready? You sure? All right. So the question is, has politics become your little G God, your idol, your religion? And you also got to remember if you were listening to the Say What series, and I know you have been, we also touched on who was really behind the human struggle from a biblical perspective. But again, today we're going to look at when politics have become your little G God, your idol, your religion. And you got to remember Christianity is not a religion. It's a person, Jesus Christ. Robin, <clears throat> excuse me, Shoemaker, an, important, an accomplished software executive and Christian apologist who has written many articles, authored and contributed to several Christian books, appeared on nationally syndicated radio programs, and has presented at apologetic events with his latest book being The Confident Faith, winning people to Christ with the apologetics of the Apostle Paul. But he recently penned an article on September the 2nd in the Christian Post. He started off by saying, I bet you think this can never happen to you. C.S. Lewis, in a book written over 80 years ago, The Screw Tape Letters, talked about the dangers of letting politics become your religion. Lewis put the following words in the mouth of his professor, old devil uncle, who was instructing a nephew on one way to wreck his human target. Let your patient begin by treating patriotism or pacifism <clears throat> as part of his religion. Then let him, under the influence of partisan spirit, come to regard it as the most important part then quietly and gradually nurse him on the stage at which the religion becomes merely part of the cause in which Christianity is valued chiefly because of the excellent arguments it can produce. Think that that could ever be you one day or even today? I hope not because you'll be miserable when it occurs, but sadly, at least on the surface, it seems to be happening a lot right now, as Shoemaker continues. Too many professing Christians on both sides of the political aisle seem to be convinced that they're in the midst of a human life and death global existential battle. And if the other side, God forbid, wins, the result will be a certain cataclysmic destruction on a national level. Sovereignty of God be un darned, they unknowingly descend to the point of defining themselves more by their social justice commitments than by their theological claims. And they have no problem either mentally or physically banishing an opponent 
should said person get one or more political positions wrong, with the exclusion being harsher than if the same individual utters some theological heresy. And even if that doesn't sound like you today, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. And this leads us to the question of how can we all guard against getting to the place where politics puts God in second place? The age-old lie from MAGA and conservative disciples on the right to liberal social justice warriors on the woke, there's no denying that shrieking quasi-religious political activism is everywhere, he writes. <clears throat> Cultural commentators debate on why it seems to be so severe and growing. Some say that ideological social media and news echo chambers have cordoned us off into warring factions. Others point to a growing spiritual emptiness inside of people that they try to feed with politics. On that point, there's little doubt that the sense of political connection many find is replacing social relationships that they <clears throat> once found in church. This is especially true for those who completely jettison their faith and seek something with that same satisfying punch. To them, political conventions can have an identical vibe to raucous and joyous church worship. A candidate's inspiring speech warns the heart just like a fiery evangelist. Doling out funds regularly to politicians' campaigns replaces tithing. But from there, things can turn a little darker. It's not long before a live and a live and let live mindset changes, and the other side is seen as an enemy who needs to be put down. Whether religious or political sectarianism is about two hostile identity groups who not only clash over policy and ideas, but see the other side as alien and immoral, writes Nate Cohn of the New York Times. It's, it's the anonistic <clears throat> feelings between the groups more than differences over ideas that drive sectarian conflict. And that conflict turns white hot when a group of people genuinely believe they have the only answer for society's ills. Pope John Paul the II the described the danger of such a scenario this way. When people think they possess the secret of a perfect social organization which makes evil impossible, they also think that they can use any means, including violence and deceit, in order to bring that organization into being. Politics then becomes a secular religion which operates under the illusion of creating paradise in this world. Sidebar. I hear Christians, you know, followers of Jesus Christ, born-again believers, forgetting, forgetting, or maybe being unaware from a biblical standpoint, that the word of God talks about one day people are going to accept right as wrong and wrong as right. And I hear Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, justifying politicians whose policies are anti Scripture. Really believing the politicians, whether it's local, federal, village, province wise, is for them until they wake up, if one does, on time to see, wait a minute, they're not just talking about that person or that person or that believer or that person. But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ of the scriptures, they're talking about you too, irrespective of your skin tone. And you'll see why I'm saying this as we continue in a little bit. 
But Schumacher, Shoemaker, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name, last name, uh, his last name correctly. He continues by saying, when that point is individually reached, two things have typically occurred inside a person. The primary objective of deliverance from societal problems is the government versus the creator. People are tired of waiting on God to make things right. Scripture has been discarded as absolute truth and moral authority. And when cultural values clash with the Bible, the culture wins. Sidebar, I think he just said the same as I just did. He continued, this metamorphosis has happened constantly throughout history, both on an individual and societal level. And he talks about what a historian, Antonio Tripolitis, had to say on the troubled Hellenistic Roman world. The general populace no longer placed his hope or faith on the ancient gods whom they believed could not alleviate their daily encounters with the Beatitudes <clears throat> of Hellenistic life. This was a period of general material and moral insecurity. The unsettling conditions of their time led people to long and search for satiria salvation and release from the burdens of finitude, the misery and failure of human life. People everywhere were keenly awake to every new message of hope and eagerly prospecting for a personal savior, someone who would bring salvation, that is deliverance or protection from the vicissitudes of this life. So as you look around today, does that sound familiar? And and he continues, the question is, how can we as Christians stop ourselves from getting into such a place? The first step can be an honest examination of ourselves and asking questions like, do I find myself witnessing more about this politician, local, state, federal, village, province-wise, than I do about Jesus Christ? And I put in the local, state, federal, and village, province-wise. Do I feel like the country is doomed more if the wrong people are elected versus if the nation rejects God and his truth? Do I view those on the opposing political side as enemies versus people to be listened to and won for Christ? Do I enjoy thinking about the defeat of my political opponents? When I imagine how God's higher purposes can be accomplished, do my thoughts immediately turn to political parties and politicians? Are my political views, practically speaking, excuse me, a key aspect of my identity? Do I think that God is on my side politically and opposed to those that disagree with me? And if so, you may have already been captured by the enemy in the way Screwtape describes to his disciple. Once you made the world an end and faith as a means, you have almost won your person. And it makes very little difference what kind of worldly hand and he's pursuing, provided that meeting pamphlets, policies, movements, causes, and crusades matter more to him than prayers and sacraments and charity. He is ours. <clears throat> A journalist, Bobby Huga Barrett, and Bobby Harrington sum up such an unfortunate end state this way, the nature of politics, right or left, <clears throat> Let me grab a sip of my water since I didn't in the beginning. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's to grow in importance to where it dictates your deepest hopes and fears. Left unchecked, it will claim your ultimate allegiance. <clears throat> you see, after I took a sip of that water, I act like I had it going on. That was a sidebar. For Christians, at this point, you're now committing idolatry. So let's not let politics become our religion. Keep God in first place and do as John says. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. First John chapter 5, verse 21. Sidebar. Before I continue, I talked about, I talked about on Say What series number 20, or program number 20, who is really behind this human stru- struggle? And I talk about the little little G gods or the idols that God took down. You said Gary took down, yes. 
Well, in order to stand all that I said, you have to tune in to say what number 20 as others have. Remember now, look at the totality. But again, I do not hear a lot of Christians today even discussing the spiritual powers behind A through Z. And the question is, why is that? Why is that? Especially if one's head is in the Word of God, allowing the Holy Spirit to clear to them, not some man, some woman, some woman, some man, or even themselves. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Twofold, wait a minute. My water, Greg Laurie also penned an article in the Christian Post title, Understanding Your Spiritual Battle Has Already Begun. And Laurie is the pastor and founder of the Harvest Churches in California and Hawaii and Harvest Crusades. He is an evangelist, best-selling author, and movie producer. Jesus Revolution, a feature film about Laurie's life from Lionsgate and Kingdom Story Company, was released in theaters. February the 24th of 2023. But he writes, but I have good news for you today. We win in the end. Guaranteed communism won't win. Neither will secularism. The gospel is going to win and the kingdom of God is going to prevail. Some Christians are surprised to find that this life as a follower of Jesus is not a cakewalk. In fact, it is a conflict. It isn't a playground. It is actually a battleground. And the question is not whether or not we will be engaged in a spiritual war. That ship has already sailed. The question is, will we win or lose in this spiritual war? Will we advance or retreat? Will we gain ground or lose ground? There are no alternatives. And if you belong to Jesus Christ, you can't sit this battle out. You can't choose to be a pacifist. Or you'll find yourself crushed on the battlefield. The day you committed your life to Jesus Christ, the day you had your spiritual eyes open, the day you turned from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that was the day the devil declared war on you. Before that time, he had you where he wanted you and was quite happy with that arrangement. But you weren't happy at all with that arrangement, and neither was I. And that's why we turned to Christ. The Bible says that the God of this world, speaking of Satan, had blinded our eyes. Scripture tells us that in the days before we put our faith in Christ, we were taken captive by Satan to do his will. You can see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. But we got sick and tired of being ripped off, and that's why we put our faith in the Lord Jesus. The devil isn't happy about you turning to Christ, and he isn't going to take this line down. He'll do everything he can to trip you up, discourage you, or defeat you on this battlefield. Anyone who chooses to be on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ will face severe opposition from Satan and his followers, the legions of demons under his command. World War II was one of the biggest conflicts in the history of mankind. Think about how different our world would be if America had had not entered that conflict. Hitler would be on the march. <clears throat> he had taken over Poland and France with Great Britain in his sights. Had the United States not entered the war, we would have had a much different world right now. But we did enter that conflict, and the world was and is a better place for it. It's not that war is a good thing. War is never desirable. But sometimes you have to fight. That was a justifiable war meaning. It was a right and worthy cause for us to stand up, especially when we learned that Hitler's goal was to eradicate the Jewish population of Europe in his so-called final solution. Most of us don't like fighting. I understand that. But some, some things are worth defending and worth fighting for. There are times when you just have to just step up to the plate and fight. It's interesting that on more than one occasion, the Christian life is compared to a conflict on a battlefield. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says, Endure suffering along with me. 
<clears throat> excuse me, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. In First Thessalonians, I mean, First Timothy chapter six, verse twelve, he says, "Fight the good fight for the true faith." It's a good fight, and each one of us needs to stand up and enter the battle. Here's why the Christ, the Church of Jesus Christ, is under attack like never before, around the world, and here in the United States, in today's entertainment media and in many political circles. <clears throat> Excuse me, as I take a sip of my water and slow down. That was more than a sip, brother. That was a gulp. <clears throat> Christians, and I know there are some of you followers of Jesus Christ, going to swear me down, it's not you. Maybe it's not. Christians are summarily mocked, marginalized, and dismissed as lunatics. Overseas, our brothers and sisters are being martyred by people who hate the message of the gospel. It's enough to cause you as a Christian to be downright discouraged. But I have good news for you today. We win in the end. Guaranteed. Communism won't win. Neither will secularism. The gospel is going to win and the kingdom of God is going to prevail. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13, we read, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Paul says, put on the full armor of God. And the phrase put on means to do it once and for all. It speaks of permanence. The full armor of God isn't something we put on and take off at bedtime. And you might need to put it on in the middle of the night. It's something to be put on permanently. You're meant to keep the armor of God on for your whole life. Why? Because the temptation and attacks will not stop until you get to heaven. You need to always keep your guard up. Here's something the devil doesn't want you to know. Satan doesn't want you to know that he was soundly defeated at the cross of Calvary by Jesus Christ. He's already a defeated foe, and he hates the fact that you would know that. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the flesh, of the devil. When Jesus cried out, it is finished on the cross, he was saying, it is done. The price has been paid. The enemy has been defeated. He had finished the work the Father had given to him. He had finished and broken Satan's stronghold on humanity and on you and me. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 tells us that at the cross, Jesus canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. What does that mean to you? You don't fight for victory. You fight from victory. Instead of pleading with him for help and strength, When we face temptation, we say, Lord, thank you that you won't give me more than I can handle. Thank you that you're more powerful than Satan. Thank you that greater is he who is in me than he that's in the world. Fighting for victory, not for victory. I'm standing on the work that Christ did for me, and it makes all the difference to that. I say, amen, brother Lord. I also want to say finally regarding politics, locally, state, federal, or maybe in your country, in your province or your village, or your states. As a follower of Jesus Christ, if the person who is running for whatever office, if their policies do not reflect My biblical beliefs, I can't talk about yours. I cannot support them. If what you put forth is anti-God of the scriptures, you are also saying clearly you're anti-Jesus Christ. 
the anti-Christian. You can say what you want. You can put it in whatever flowery language you want, but that's what you're saying. I am the one who have to stand before God as a follower of Jesus Christ. When he calls my name, and you look at any obituary around the globe, there's no certain age. Is there a certain skin tone? Is there a certain classism? Is there a certain title? Everybody's equal when it comes to death. But I'm the one who has to stand before God and give an account. Think about it. It has nothing to do with race. Gender, skin tone, for a follower of Jesus Christ. I haven't said that. I want to close out with a message that a young female black posted that have now been heard by millions, millions. Why is that? Why is that? For me, everything in 2020 shifted. And there are some people who noticed it sooner, but the best way I can describe it is life was like a game of musical chairs. You know, everyone was doing their own thing, living life, whatever. And in 2020, for me, it felt like God stopped the music. The world stopped. And everyone scattering for their chairs. But what was really happening when God stopped that music, it was time for everyone to start picking a side. The veil was lifted. He started showing everything. Everyone's scattering. Now we're picking sides. And I feel that way because it's been hundreds of thousands of people just like me who out of nowhere felt called by God, snatched up by God. Like my whole life, I was living lukewarm for 25 years. And randomly in 2023, January of 23, God called me. He woke me up. Nothing had happened before that. I didn't hear a sermon that touched me. I didn't have a word spoke to me. It was a random night. The Holy Spirit came over me and woke me up. And I remember vividly hearing God telling me, you have to pick a side. You have to pick a side. You have to choose this day who you're going to serve. And now everyone's picking their sides. Now, don't get me wrong. Satan has always been the god of this world. But I noticed a drastic uptick after 2020 in the demonic rituals we were seeing, the subliminal messages and all the media and movies and art. It just was so blatantly obvious that there was a spiritual war going on to the point where non-believers, believers, everyone's seeing it at this point. Normal music artists were now dressing up as Satan doing rituals. Like, what? And then out of nowhere, there was a lot of celebrities or just people in general randomly coming to Christ. Like, y'all, that's not a coincidence. Something is happening. Whether you believe or not, we all feel something is coming. Something's happening. And it's not normal. And this isn't me being crazy. I'm just being real, a real human being right now. There's so many days where I like zone out and I feel so disconnected from my body and I start feeling like something's happening, something's about to happen. And I don't know, I don't know if it's a feeling from God, like he's warning me, but lately I have been feeling more led to share this message and speak because it seems like everyone's just going throughout life and ignoring it when we all feel it. You can deny it all you want. But we know what is happening right now is not normal. And of course, there's going to be people who are like, oh, Christians are trying to fear monger people or trying to force their beliefs on people. It has nothing to do with that. I gain nothing from trying to put fear in anybody. I'm just speaking facts and living in reality. And I notice that when Christians speak, it's a problem or we're pushing our agenda. But y'all been letting Satan push his agenda since the beginning of time. Look at the things we watch. He's in what we listen to. He's everywhere. But we're okay with that. You know, there, there's Satanist groups at schools now, in elementary schools. But, but that's fine. Like, this world is so backwards. So all in all, regardless of what you believe or what you don't believe, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'm passionate about this 
because my heart has been so heavy, you know. I pray and I just hope that all people get to know God. They come to know him. They come to repentance and realize that this life is temporary. This life is but a vapor. And our soul will go somewhere after this. We have a true living God to answer to after this. In the times we're in now, this is just the beginning. This is a time where we need to cling to him the most.